much. Uh, and first, may I apologize for my complete lack of French. I hope you will, you will bear with me. Um, I understand that there is translation available. Um, Mikhail has given us a wonderful exposition of a very large number of biases that we face when investing. And I think this is, it's, it's, it's fascinating to know that over the last 50 years, we as humans know so much more about how we are fallible, about how we can be irrational, about how we can fail to follow logical process. But I want to take these biases and put them into a different framework. I'm actually going to start from where Mikhail left off. And although it's interesting to look at all these lists of biases, I think almost all of them can be seen in a very simple framework. Every single decision that we make as humans, we make now, we make in the present. And that means that every single decision we make, there is a constant trade-off between the decision that is right, the decision that is sensible for my long-term financial needs, and the decision that feels comfortable to me now. And so every decision that we make, there is constantly this trade-off between a good decision and a comfortable, comfortable decision. And as humans, all of these biases can be seen as, as a whole plethora of different ways in which we run away from the right decision and we chase emotional comfort because we don't like, as humans, to feel uncomfortable, so we, we seek this comfort. Now, the question I'm going to start to try and address is not to, to, to repeat what Mikhail has, has so brilliantly exposed to you, but rather to think, how do we take this knowledge and start to use it to design ways of making better decisions? Now, you all might be interested at the moment in um, uh, what Ulysses could possibly have to do with investing. So I'm going to start with a slide that has nothing to do with finance whatsoever. There is Ulysses. Ulysses is the gentleman there being tied to the mast. Now, in this very famous story from Homer's Odyssey, Ulysses is sailing home from Troy, and he encounters the island of the Sirens, these beautiful sea nymphs who, who sing this incredibly beautiful song. And no sailor has ever been able to resist the siren's call. They get whipped up into a frenzy of excitement and they jump overboard and they die because they dash themselves to death on the rocks. Now, like classical finance theory, Ulysses can sit down and he can figure out what is the rational thing for me to do. Now, the rational, the rational strategy here is to go, well, the siren's call is beautiful, so I want to listen to it. It gives me utility. So I should listen to the siren's call, and after that, I should exert my steel willpower. I should say, thank you very much, sirens. That was lovely. And then I should sail on home to Troy. Unlike all of classical finance theory, however, Ulysses knows he's human. He knows he's fallible, and he knows he is likely to succumb to temptation. And this knowledge leads him to do something very fundamental. Before he gets into an emotionally worked up state, he creates for himself tools to improve the decision making of his own future self. He gets his crew to bind him to the mast with ropes so he can hear the sirens call, but he can't succumb to his own emotional whims at the time. And his crew all have to block up their ears with beeswax so they immunize themselves against the sirens call. And what they have effectively done is they have built for themselves decision prosthetics. They have built for themselves tools ahead of time in order to make themselves better decision makers at the time. And to me, this is really what all of applied behavioral finance is about. It's trying to find ways of systematically building ourselves tools, decision prosthetics, that can narrow this gap between the right answer and the comfortable answer. And I have to say in passing that the more I show this slide, the more I wonder whether how, how in fact blocking your ears with beeswax entirely solves the temptation issue here. But we shall move on from that. This one is a visual illusion that I think pretty much all of you have seen. And it's going to start from where Mikhail ended up because this is an illustration of the tortoise and the hare, the fast and slow decision making. This uh, illusion was first published in the 1890s, and the question is, which of these two parallel lines is longest? And pretty much all of us look at that and we go, bottom line looks longer, except I've seen it before. I know it's a visual illusion. I know these two lines are the same length. 
And the reason I show this is this is an illustration of that tortoise and hare decision making. We as humans have two systems of reasoning. We have our logical, our deliberative brain, the one that enables me to sit down, solve maths problems, plan for the future, think logically and sequentially through a problem. But always turned on and lightning fast is also my emotional brain. And the emotional brain is constantly feeding me signals about my intuition, about my gut feel. So I can look at this problem and I can know that these two lines are the same length. But at the same time, my emotional brain is always going, yeah, but the bottom one just looks longer. The problem with this is in f financial decision making is like living inside a giant visual illusion. Every single decision we make, there is information from the immediate context, from what we've read in the newspaper, from what our clients are telling us, from what our colleagues are telling us, that our emotional brain is responding to and it leads to us being uncomfortable with what our rational brain is telling us is the right answer. And we would love to turn it off. We would love to make the illusion disappear. But we can't because we're human and because we make decisions in the present. What we can do is we can find ways of, of reframing the decision to ourselves. I can add extra information to this decision that doesn't change the question, it doesn't change the answer. What it does is it, makes, it reduces the gap between the right answer and the emotional answer. I can add those two tram lines there and my emotional brain is no longer seeing the illusion. And that's what we need to be seeking to do. Now, financial decision making is costly. Our emotional brain impinges costs on us. Every time we do what feels comfortable at the expense of what is right, it imposes a cost on our long-term returns. And Mikhail has gone through a large number of these. I'll just touch on the one that is probably most familiar to all of us. If we are going to take investment risk, if we're going to get good investment returns, we need to take risk, period. If we are going to take risk, it is not a question of whether your portfolio will drop in value at some time. Your portfolio will drop in value at some point in time. So taking risk involves an up and down. And if we as humans, if our emotional brain is leading us to seek comfort along that journey, we are in danger of doing this, of putting too much, taking too much risk when times feel good, when the world is full of good news stories, and we are in danger of doing that, of reducing our risk when times are bad. You don't need me here to stand and say, to invest well, you should buy low and sell high, and not the reverse. And yet, our psychology as humans inclines us to do exactly the opposite. And the problem with this is if I buy high, if I sell low, and it could just be in the subtle ways, I may be emotionally comfortable at every step along the journey, but like Ulysses, I'm going to end up costing myself dearly. I'm going to end up poor. And that's known as the behavior gap. The fact that by following our gut feel, by doing what feels right to us along the journey, we inevitably end up giving away returns. And that has been studied in many markets around the world. It's probably fair to say, looking across all of the academic evidence in, in various countries, that the average retail investor, relative to putting your money in and leaving it alone, relative to buy and hold, the behavior gap of their own timing decisions probably costs them in the region of one and a half to 2% per year. Now, when you consider that a buy and hold strategy, once you've invested, requires nothing more than complete ignorance to follow through on, the fact that the average human being underperforms complete ignorance by one and a half to two percent a year gives you a sense of how costly these things can be. What can we do about it? Well, like Ulysses, we need to seek the tools. So if there are ways of me going, well, if I give you this, you're not going to end, sorry, if I give you this, you're not going to end up at your perfect portfolio solution. You're going to end up down there because you're a human. If instead I could find ways of removing the emotional high and the emotional low, I might be able to give you the emotional comfort in a cheap and efficient way, such that you can stick with that portfolio and not make all of these behavioral errors along the journey. Now, you will notice it ends up slightly worse. This has a cost to us. But we can think of that as emotional insurance. It is much better for us to incur a small cost relative to, perfect, to perfection to avoid ourselves failing very expensively later. 
And all of the tools that I'm going to talk about really do incur costs. Some of them, maybe you give up a bit of return. Mostly, what you have to give up is time and energy, because building tools for better decision making is, is pretty easy. Well, it's pretty simple in the sense that none of these things are rocket science. They're all fairly basic concepts. It's simple, but it is not easy because it takes work, it takes building habits, it takes effort on our part. Now, there are three things that we all need to do if we are going to make better decisions by design. Firstly, we need self-knowledge. Ulysses would not have survived the sirens unless he had sufficient knowledge to know that he was fallible, unless he knew he was going to be tempted. Secondly, we need to take control of the environment. Almost all of the biases that we, say, what we see in financial decision making are because the immediate environment imposes need for comfort on our brains. And if we can control our environment, we can change that, that, that equation. And lastly, we need to look for decision prosthetics. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on each one of these in turn. So firstly, self-knowledge. Possibly the biggest problem that any of us have as investors is, is the confirmation bias. We all love to believe that we arrive at our opinions and our beliefs, having looked at the evidence, weighing the evidence, and coming up to a belief. The reality is it's often very, very much the, up, the other way around. As humans, we tend to decide what we want to believe, and then we start looking for evidence to corroborate it. And so here is a study that was done in Korea. They looked at investors, these were professional investors, and they asked them ahead of time for a whole bunch of stocks. Are you strong sell, strong buy, buy, sell? What's your, what's your strength of belief on this stock? And they put them in an experimental environment, and the experiment was not actually to see how well they traded. The experiment was to see which of the pieces of information that were flicking across the top of the screen did people click on in order to learn more about the, the stocks they were about to trade on. Now, if as humans, we want to be trading, we want to be investing, uh, and we want to be doing it well, we need to be doing that with accurate odds. And if I am constantly making up a story of what I want to believe in and then looking for evidence that corroborates it, I'm effectively going to be gambling against reality with the wrong odds. And so what we tend to find, if, if, if we as humans want to be as accurate in our beliefs as possible, what we should be constantly looking for is things that can tell us we're wrong. And yet, what people do, people who are strong by, they clicked on 80% of the messages going across that agreed with what they already thought. They, they clicked on only 10% of things that may, may tell them that they are wrong. And we see this all over the place. In the heights of the internet bubble, there was books coming out, Dow 36,000, Dow 60,000. And we know in, in retrospect that the internet bubble burst and that, that, that was, this was all silly stuff. So you would think if you picked up one of these books and you started reading it, it would be complete nonsense. And yet it's not. I have, I have a few of these books. You read them, they are in fact incredibly articulate, very well-reasoned, very sophisticated, complex arguments for complete nonsense. Because as humans, we are capable of constructing edifices of knowledge, edifices of intelligence, of reasoning, to defend what we've already decided we want to believe. And that is very difficult for us to exit. There are ways of doing so, however. Find ways of always making sure that you have a devil's advocate, even if it's just you to yourself, writing down reasons for and against every decision you make. Try and always find the other side of the argument. In group decision making, there is an increasing, and a lot of evidence, and increasing evidence that the, the single simplest thing you can do to make groups better decision makers is to increase diversity. Gender diversity, skill diversity, cultural diversity, these things turn groups into better decision makers because you get a better, bigger range of opinions there. That is where we all cling, cling to, though. We would, rather, we would rather go to a reassuring lie to, be, to find information that tells us what we already are comfortable with believing rather than make ourselves psychologically uncomfortable by looking for the real information. There's a whole range of things we can do here. So, Tracking and measurement. If you look at decision making in other fields, uh, military aviation, elite sports, people are using biometrics, people are using information to track their every single move in order to improve their behavior. This is something that the financial industry has become, come very late to. 
I have a friend uh, who worked at Barclays who was a genuine Top Gun fighter pilot. And he said that those pilots were tracked, every physiological measure, every emotional measure, and if they displayed the slightest cold or the slightest signal of emotional angst, they weren't put behind the wheel of a, or the wheel, the cockpit of a four billion piece of, of, of military hardware. And yet in investing, we often let people go and make million pound decisions, regardless of whether they've been out to four in the morning the night before. External opinions. We can use tools about asking others. 360 reviews, asking your peers, using coaches, using friends, asking your manager. If done systematically, these are the things that can very effectively debias ourselves. Psychometric assessment. Um, we at Oxford Risk construct a whole lot of psychological scales that measure different aspects of financial personality. What these can tell me is at an individual level, what is likely to make someone comfortable or in uncomfortable with the right answer along the investment journey? And we can then start to deliberately use this information to hold their hands better, to guide them, to, to buy them emotional comfort as cheaply, as efficiently as possible. And then lastly, the notion of, of mindfulness and deliberate practice. These are things that are, have been coming out that until quite recently, the academic world treated as, as mumbo jumbo, meditation, mindfulness. There is all sorts of evidence that the best investors and the best traders in the world do one thing really well. They are able to step back and notice their own emotional state, and therefore they are able to realize whether their emotional state needs calming down or it needs pepping up. In other words, they are mindful. They are able to control and regulate their own emotions. There is this myth that, motion, that emotions should be um, suppressed in decision making. Someone who is incapable of experiencing emotions, and there are such people with particular lesions to parts of the brain, you would think that if someone can't experience emotions, they would become a great decision maker because they are not faced with all these biases. Actually, in order to make a decision at all, we have to care about the future. We have to have an emotional attachment to some future outcome. So people who cannot experience emotions actually become worse decision makers frequently, not better. So we need to find ways of controlling and regulating emotion. Control of the environment is, is a very important one. Almost all of these biases that we hear about are biases that come from us not having control of the environment. And one of the simplest things we can do to control our environment is filter information. Many years ago, I was um, actually almost 10 years ago to the day, because it was just after the advent of the financial crisis, I was due to speak on Bloomberg. And um, as, as is often in my case, I was talking about long-term psychological states of the market. And of course, at that period of time, no one wanted to, to hear anything about long-term anything. It was just, are we going to survive today? Are we going to survive this week? And after me reiterating my point again and again, well, in the long term, we should do this. In the long term, we should do that. The TV presenter in exasperation said, well, we're not in the long term. Is there anything for those investors who are stressed now? Is there anything you can suggest that they should do? And to my eternal embarrassment, I reached for the first thing that popped into my mind. And I said, yes, well, um, they could turn off Bloomberg for a start. Um, it was several years before I was invited back. Uh, the information we look at can make a huge difference. So here is an experiment that was done uh, on p real people making real decisions about their retirement accounts uh, in, uh, through Morningstar.com. So Richard Thaler, Shlomo Benazzi, Richard Thaler. Thaler is this year's Nobel Prize winner. They went to Morningstar and they said, we'd like to run an experiment on your clients. And Morningstar said, no, I'm not sure we want you running experiments on, on our clients. What did you have in mind? And they described the experiment, and Morningstar said, well, that will have no effect. Be our guest, go ahead. So they split these people into two piles. In one pile, these were people allocating their 401k retirement, uh, uh, retirement funds in, um, in America. They had to, this particular company, they had allocated between eight different funds. And in the one pile of people, they gave them the standard thing, and they said, how many funds do you use? And they watched people allocate their retirement accounts, and there were a couple of people who used all eight funds, a few people who put it all into one fund, but most people spread their money between three, four, or five funds. The second group of people, they said, let's imagine that you've given this problem to a web designer who thinks the page looks a bit cluttered. And that web designer has said, 
well, we'll do one simple thing. We'll just put four funds on the one page, and then with a single click, you can go to four funds on the second page. And Morningstar thought this would have no difference, and it should have no difference, because it is not costly for us to click and look at the second page. And of course, people did click and look at the second page, but that single change of information completely changed the fund of choice. And this is people making real decisions with their real retirement money. And you would think, well, that's, that's ridiculous, that's irrational, until you realize that these people aren't financial professionals. So they looked at the second page and they went, I don't know why these four are on the second page, but Morningstar must have a reason for putting these four on the second page. So most people only chose from the first page. Now, the, the secret of that is this. An accidental design choice made by your web designer who wants to make things look pretty. If you had four bond funds and four equity funds, funds and the four bond funds were all, all a nice blue color, and the four equity funds were all a nice green color, and that person chose to put all the green funds first and the blue funds second, you can have fundamentally changed someone's risk allocation for the next 30 years by an accidental design choice by your web designer. Information matters. Here's a, a, an important one for investing. If you have an investor with a long-term time horizon, if you've got a long-term investor, and arguably any other sort of investor is an oxymoron, I think they were a speculator was the phrase uh, used earlier. Um, if you have a long-term time horizon, the information you should be looking at is the information that is aligned to your objectives. So here I have an, uh, an investor who has a 10-year time horizon, and I'm looking at the historical returns from the MSCI World Equity Index. 100% equity, so really, really risky investment. You would never give this to someone as their whole portfolio. And yet, if I look at this equity portfolio, looked at through the lens of what this person is trying to achieve, looked at through the lens of their 10-year um, their horizon, what we see is it doesn't look that risky. On average, your 10-year rolling returns are 11% per year every year for 10 years. Not bad. Only very briefly, in the biggest moment of financial catastrophe that any of us have lived through, do the 10-year returns even briefly drop below zero. And the right conclusion to take from that is not the conclusion that most people took in March 2009, which is, you told me long-term investing doesn't work, my portfolio is slightly down on where it was 10 years ago, panic. No, the right conclusion to take from that is don't sell now. Here is the problem, as humans, we do not perceive the world through rolling 10-year annualized returns. We perceive the world now, in the present. And if I show you exactly the same investment looked at through a 12-month uh, horizon, it looks like that. Same investment, different way of looking at the information. Now, if you took any investor and you showed them information that was the purple chart or you showed them information that was the gray chart, you will induce a different emotional state. And just to give you one point, if you had invested in March 2008 and sold in March 2009, your total returns would be in the order of minus 50%. I challenge anyone to experience total returns of minus 50% and not have an emotional response to it. It cannot be done. And so how we present information to people and how we present information to ourselves is vitally important. And to be able to sit down and do a decision audit and figure out what is right and wrong for you is very important. Lastly, decision prosthetics. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. <clears throat> Particularly, I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are a whole raft of tools out there. The single thing to, be, to remember here is we need to do what Ulysses had done. The most important thing we can do to improve our decision making is to take decisions away from our future emotionally charged self and give it to ourself now when we are cool, calm, and collected and we can think about the right answer. And that means that we should take, take, take the time out to write for ourselves a decision constitution. What are the set of things that I believe and how do I want to act in the future? And they come into three broad categories. What is in and out of scope for me? Now, for example, I years ago came to the conclusion that I have absolutely no ability to predict currency positions, currency movements. To be honest, I have some doubt as to whether anyone has the ability to predict currency movements, but I certainly know that I don't. So I wrote for myself a rule in my decision constitution that said, thou shalt not take currency positions. And for a few months, I was quite tempted. And after that, it's just out of mind, out of scope, out of mind. 
Warren Buffett talks a lot about the circle of competence, and he quotes Lee Iacocca to say, I'm not that smart. I'm smart in spots, and I stick around those spots. And if you take the time to figure out where am I justified in making decisions, and where do I need help, or where do I just put them out of scope, and write that down, that instantly will turn you into a better decision maker. Pre-programmed actions, like Ulysses locking himself in, the more decisions we can take away from ourselves so that we don't have to make those decisions on the spot at the time, the better. And the more we can automate them, delegate them, give them, give them away, so that we never even have to have them enter our, our, our consciousness at that point in time, the better we will be as decision makers. And you could think about all the decisions you make. To go for a month, list out all the investment decisions you're making, and figure out which of them you could have decided was a good decision well ahead of time, and simply automate it or put it in the calendar. And lastly, contingency plans. The fact that markets go down should never be a surprise to any of us. We know that markets will go down. And so when they do, we should have a plan for what to do about it. And we can start putting these things into practice. We can start using things to, assess, uh, to, to test our assumptions. We can take tools from the military. We can use simulations and war games, find people to play the enemy, task a red team, take a member of your staff and, and get them to grill that your, your investment thesis. These are all tools that we can use ahead of time to, to improve our own decision making. Now, I'm going to end with this. This is a, a picture of a very particular moment in history. This is uh, in 1997, when um, Garry Kasparov, the world chess champion at the time, uh, was beaten by IBM's Deep Blue. And he doesn't look very happy about it. Um, now, what is interesting here? Yes, it's the first time that the best chess player in the world was beaten by a computer. So the new best chess player in the world must be a computer, right? Well, it turns out, no. 12 months later, Garry Kasparov played an exhibition match against another grandmaster, but there was one big difference. It wasn't man on man. Each of them played with a chess computer alongside themselves, and they rather evocatively called the centaur chess. It's the centaur half man, half horse. So the computer was the power, the brute force running the numbers, and the man was, was, was the man. And this chess is still being played today, and it turns out that the highest quality chess being played today by some margin is not supercomputers playing people or grandmasters playing grandmasters. It's these centaurs. It is teams of computer plus people that work effectively together. And what is particularly interesting about that is the person part of that partnership is very seldom themselves a grandmaster. Because what, not, what matters in the human is not that human's uncanny ability to make good decisions. It is that human's ability to work with the system. We're in a world now where we're, we're getting to decision prosthetics that are more sophisticated, where we can start to use tools and systems that go well beyond the Ulysses uh, ropes. And if we build for ourselves decision prosthetics well, we get the centaur, we get the power, the strength, and the speed of the horse, and the ability to deal with ambiguity and, 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 and values of the human. If we get it wrong, we build the slightly less useful reverse centaur. Thank you very much.